Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about some of the books that are releasing in February of 2023. So during Bookmas, I did a video about all of the 2023 releases that are on my radar. However, that video was very short, not a whole lot of releases. It only went through like September. I'm not entirely sure if that was because really no releases had been announced for the later part of the year or if there really just weren't any that I was interested in. But either way, that was really just focused on books that I might be interested in in 2023. So what I wanted to try to do going forward is to release monthly videos about the books that are coming out in the following month. A little bit more in detail with a lot more options just to give you a better idea of what is coming out that you might be interested in. So we're going to go ahead and talk about the February releases today just as a caveat here because these are new release books and I don't necessarily know a whole heck and ton about them. I will probably be doing a lot of synopsis reading on Goodreads. Like I said this is just to give you an idea of what is coming out and what these books are about and so you can make your own decision on whether you might want to add them to your TBR. So without further ado let's go ahead and jump in. Starting with February 1st of course we have No Home for Killers by E.A. Amar. This sounds like it's about two sisters who are going to try to investigate the murder of their brother. It says, the murder of jazz musician and social activist Marcus Pena doesn't come as a surprise to his estranged sisters. Melinda and Emily Pena know their controversial brother had enemies. After all, even they hadn't spoken to Marcus since their mother's funeral two years ago. To unravel the truth, Melinda and Emily must first face their own demons. Melinda, a former social worker, suffers from PTSD, haunted by the people she failed to help and unable to maintain meaningful relationships. Emily also pushes people away, afraid she'll get hurt and afraid they'll find out that she's three strikes, a masked vigilante who violently punishes abusive men. Okay, so we got a little bit of female rage going on here. I'm here for it. Marcus wasn't a good man, but he was family, and it's up to his sisters to uncover his lifetime of lies and the truth of his death. Haunting, gripping, and relevant, No Home for Killers explores the conflicts that tear families apart and the tragedies that force them back together. Okay, so it definitely sounds like we've got a lot of family drama here, probably family secrets, complex character dynamics, which I love, a murder mystery investigation, siblings. It sounds like it's got a lot going for it. I haven't necessarily decided if I want to go ahead and add it to my TBR, but it does sound interesting. I'm loving the female rage aspect of it. Wasn't really expecting that. So like I said, that does come out on February 1st if you are interested. That seems to be the only book that I have down for the first. So moving on into the seventh, we do have a book that I talked about in that video from Book Mist. It is Someone Else's Shoes by Jeju Moyes. This is a contemporary that seems to be like it might be about second chances and it's kind of playing on the walk a mile in someone else's shoes concept. It says Nisha Cantor lives the globetrotting life of the seriously wealthy until her husband announces a divorce and cuts her off. Nisha is determined to hang on to her glamorous life, but in the meantime, she must scramble to cope. She doesn't even have the shoes she was until a moment ago standing in. That's because Sam Camp, in the bleakest point of her life, has accidentally taken Nisha's gym bag, but Sam hardly has time to worry about a lost gym bag. She's struggling to keep herself and her family afloat. When she tries on Nisha's six inch high Christian Louboutin red crocodile shoes, the resulting jolt of confidence that makes her realize something must change, and that thing is herself. Full of Jojo Moyes' signature humor, brilliant storytelling, and warmth, someone else's shoes is a story about how just one little thing can suddenly change everything. I think I mentioned this before, but my only experience with Jojo Moyes was Me Before You, and I really actually enjoyed that story a lot. I thought that it was a beautiful story. I know it gets a lot of criticism, but I personally enjoyed it. And so I'm willing to give Jojo Moyes another shot. I want to see what she can do. And this just sounds like it is going to be a lovely story about second chances and possibly like finding out who you are and things of that nature. And like I said, this comes out on the 7th. Also on the 7th, we have Codename Sapphire by Pam Jenoff. Pam Jenoff is a historical fiction writer and I have read one other of her World War II historical fictions and I really enjoyed it. And so when I saw that this was coming out, I definitely wanted to give it a shot, especially after it says, a woman must rescue her cousin's family from a train bound for Auschwitz in this riveting tale of bravery and resistance. So it sounds like we're following a main character who is trying to escape Nazi Germany. Her husband was killed in a pogrom and she really has nowhere else to go. So she goes to live with her cousin, Lily. And during this time, she ends up joining the Sapphire Line, which is basically a resistance movement. But then something tragic happens and Hannah's cousin Lily, the one that she's been living with, ends up getting arrested and they are now heading towards Auschwitz. And so Hannah's loyalties are kind of tested because she has to figure out should she save her family? Should she stay with the resistance? I absolutely love World War II historical fictions that focus on resistance, especially when it involves women-led resistance. And I feel like World War II was a really big time for them to shine. And I just love seeing that come out in some of these historical fiction novels. And so that really intrigued me about this. And that's why I wanted to put it on this list, especially since I had prior positive experience with Pam Jenoff. So again, that comes out on the 7th. Also on the 7th, we have Secretly Yours by Tessa Bailey. And it sounds like this might be turning into a series of at least companion novels because this is considered a Vine mess book number one. I believe Secretly Yours is going to be a grumpy sunshine romance. It says, Hallie Welsh fell hard for Julian Voss at 14 after they almost kissed in the dark vineyards of his family's winery. Now the prodigal hottie has returned to their small town. When Hallie is hired to revamp the gardens on the Voss estate, she wonders if she'll finally get that smooch. But the grumpy professor isn't the 
teenager she remembers and their polar opposite personalities clash spectacularly. One wine-fueled girls night later, Hallie can't shake the sense that she did something reckless and then she remembers the drunken secret admirer letter she left for Julian. On sabbatical from his Ivy League job, Julian plans to write a novel, but having Hallie gardening right outside his window is the ultimate distraction. She's eccentric, chronically late, often literally covered in dirt, and so unbelievably beautiful he can't focus on anything else until he finds an anonymous letter sent by a woman from his past. Even as Julian wonders about his admirer, he's sucked further into Hallie's orbit. Hallie is a burst of color in Julian's grayscale life. For a man who irons his socks and runs on a tight schedule, her sunny chaotic energy makes zero sense. But there's something so familiar about her, and her very presence is turning his world upside down. Okay, so it sounds like maybe he doesn't remember Hallie from his past. So maybe he's thinking the secret admirer letter is from Hallie, not realizing that she's that same person, if that makes sense. I'm not sure. I'm getting a little bit of confusion here with the secret admirer letter, but this sounds really cute. And I really do want to read more from Tessa Bailey, especially after reading It Happened One Summer and then Window Shopping. I really enjoyed both of those. And she has strong potential to be one of my like favorite romance authors. So we will see how this one goes. And then the final book that I have here coming out on the 7th is Just My Type by Fallon Ballard. It sounds like this might be a second chance romance. It says Lana Parker has never been single for long. After a disastrous breakup with her high school boyfriend, Seth Carson, Lana's bounced from long-term relationship to long-term relationship. She's an expert girlfriend, even acting as the resident dating and relationship columnist for one of Los Angeles' trendiest websites. But now at the age of 30, Lana suddenly finds herself single again, and she's determined to stay that way, no matter how challenging. That is, until her high school ex, Seth, now a journalist in his own right, takes an assignment at Lana's site. Ready to put down roots after years of traveling and freelancing, Seth becomes not only Lana's colleague, but also her competitor. With their combative relationship history and undeniable chemistry, they quickly find themselves pitted against each other in a battle of wits, writing an article series that goes against dating type. For Londa, that means writing about staying single and embracing it. For Seth, it's learning to settle down and become boyfriend material. Whoever's is most popular wins a highly coveted columnist spot that either could only dream of, but when the two square off against one another, it's not only their careers on the line, it's also their hearts. So I'm getting a lot of the hating game vibes from this, although I've never read it and personally I DNF that story. I know that it's super popular, but I got into it and it wasn't what I was expecting. But I'm getting some of the similar vibes here because you have two people only in this they are exes and now they are competing against each other for a prize basically it sounds like they are going to come back together and find themselves again so it's kind of like a combination of second chance but also kind of like hate to love in a sense as well and it sounds really super cute i haven't officially added this to my tbr but it did sound really fun and i wanted to go ahead and mention it here next moving on into the 14th we have stone cold fox by rachel kohler croft what i'm getting from the synopsis of this is that it follows our main character b and she has basically spent a lifetime with her mother conning men and that's basically how they make their living and and B doesn't want to do that anymore. She wants to settle down, but she doesn't want to just settle down. She wants to settle down and marry rich because that's what she thinks that she deserves. And so she sets her sights on one of the most wealthiest families in the country. But of course, she's going to have to basically fool all of his family. And it sounds like she's going to go toe to toe with her fiance's best friend, who is sounds like it's going to be a little bit suspicious about her. And so they start this cat and mouse game and B secrets are threatened to be revealed and things like that. So it sounds like this could be a very fun, fast paced thriller. It doesn't necessarily sound like it's going to be anything of substance or anything deep, possibly very much plot driven and not character driven, which is really not my thing. But I definitely wanted to throw that out there for those that might like a somewhat lighter thriller. That sounds like that is what this is going to be. And so I wanted to mention it here. And like I said, this comes out on the 14th of February. Also on the 14th is Bright and Deadly Things by Lexi Elliott. This is one that I hadn't heard of before and I'm not familiar with Lexi Elliott as an author. But what intrigued me about this is that it sounds like it might have those isolationist vibes that I very much love in my thrillers. It's set at like a French chalet which is also giving me a little bit of one by one vibes by Ruth Ware. So there are some buzzwords here that I'm getting and so that intrigued me enough to put it on this list. It says the chalet de Anglais should be the ideal locale for recently widowed Oxford Dawn Emily to begin cutting through the fog of her grief. With no electricity, running water, or access by car, the rustic chalet nestled at the foot of the Verdant snow-topped Alps should afford Emily both time and space to heal. Joining her will be a collection of friends from the university as well as other fellows, graduates, and undergraduates. Something feels off though, heightening Emily's existing grief induced anxiety. Before even making it to the airport, she's unnerved by a breaking at her home. Once at the chalet, tension amongst the guests is palpable. Her friends and colleagues are behaving oddly and competition for a newly opened position has introduced a streak of meanness into the otherwise relaxing getaway. As hostilities grow, Emily begins to wonder if the chalet's dark history has cast a shadow over the retreat. Someone very real has been searching through Emily's things and attempting to hack into her computer. When a student disappears, Emily realizes that she'd better separate friend from foe and real from imagined, or the next disappearance may be her own. So yes, I'm definitely getting a lot of one by one vibes, not just because of the setting, but because it sounds like there are going to be like Paul students, things like that, maybe competing against each other or just there for, you know, for their own reasons. And then one of them goes missing. So does it sound like anything super unique? No, but it has some buzzwords in there that really get to me. So I'm considering adding this to my TBR. Also on the 14th, we have On the Savage Side by Tiffany McDaniel. And what drew me to this one is that it's 
kind of based around the true crime of the Chillicothe Six. So it says six women, mothers, daughters, sisters, gone missing. When the first is found floating dead in the river, it reveals the disturbing truth of a small Ohio town. Inspired by the unsolved murders of the Chillicothe Six, this harrowing and haunting novel tells the story of two sisters, both of whom could be the next victims. It follows two twin sisters, Arcade and Daffodil. They seem to be very close, but they can't escape the generational chaos that grips their family. Growing up in the shadow of the town, the sisters cling tight to one another. As an adult, Arcade wrestles with these memories of her life, just as a local woman is discovered drowned in the river. Soon more bodies are found. While her friends disappear around her, Arcade is forced to reckon with the past while the killer circles ever closer. Arcade's promise to keep herself and her sister safe become increasingly desperate, while the powerful riptide of the savage side becomes more difficult to resist. This definitely sounds like it's going to have a lot more darkness to it than, say, Stone Cold Fox, which I just talked about, which I love. I do love a good dark and gruesome thriller, where, as Audrey from Chapter and Converse would say, there are dark and messed up people doing dark and messed up things. That is my vibe. That is my jam. That's one of the reasons why I love Karen Sauter so much. So again, a lot of buzzwords here that I'm very, very much intrigued by. And because of that, I wanted to go ahead and mention it here to y'all in case it sounded up your alley as well. Moving on into the 21st of February, we have The Library of Banned Books by Brianna Labuskis. This is a historical fiction novel, and it says that it intertwines the fates of three women who believe in the power of books to triumph over the very darkest moments of war. I don't want to read the synopsis because it is very lengthy, but it is set in three timelines. Berlin, 1933, Paris, 1936, and New York, 1944. And it sounds like it also follows censorship. There was a lot of censorship that was going on in Nazi Germany. So it sounds like this might have a lot to do with fighting censorship, which I'm here for. And it says, inspired by the true story of the Council of Books in Wartime, the World War II organization founded by booksellers, publishers, librarians, and authors to use books as weapons in the war of ideas. The Librarian of Burned Books is an unforgettable historical novel, a haunting love story, and a testament to the beauty, power, and goodness of the written word. That sounds absolutely phenomenal. I am not familiar with Brianna Labuskis, but it does seem like she has a backlist. So I might have to go check out more of her work because this sounds fascinating. And another thing that I love in World War II historical fictions, or even in thrillers or other stories, is when there are multiple timelines and they are woven together in some clever and creative way, as you're finding out how they all connect, how they inspire one another, and things of that nature. And it sounds like that's what this book is going to do, and I'm excited for it. And I'm definitely going to be adding this one to my TBR because it sounds phenomenal. Also, on the 21st, we have The Writing Retreat by Julie Bartz, and this follows our main character, Alex, who is a struggling writer, and she's basically given up all of her dreams of becoming a published writer. But then she's given the opportunity to attend this very exclusive writing retreat at the estate of this feminist horror novelist and she is not going to pass that up. But when she and the other attendees arrive, this writer kind of drops a bombshell. She says, while you're here, y'all are going to be expected to write a novel from scratch. You can't continue on anything else that you've been working on. And whoever is determined to have written the best novel will receive a life-changing seven-figure publishing deal. And so naturally our main character Alex is absolutely determined to win this, but it says, Alex buckles down and tries to ignore the strange happenings at the estate, including Rose's erratic behavior. But then when one of the writers vanishes during a snowstorm, Alex realizes that something very sinister is afoot. With the clock running out, she's desperate to discover the truth and save herself. Claustrophobic and propulsive thriller exploring the dark side of friendships and fame, The Writing Retreat is the unputdownable debut novel from a compelling new talent. So again, I'm getting some definite isolationist vibes here because you have all of these attendees who are secluded away at this exclusive retreat, probably in a remote location. And then of course there are sinister things happening. One of the writers goes missing. There's a competition. So again, very much a one by one esque type of book and I'm here for it. This is another one that I talked about during that book miss video. It is already on my radar, already on my TBR. And I didn't even know that this was a debut novel, which makes me even more curious to read it. I don't know if I will get to it in 2023, because like I said, I'm trying to focus very much on my backlist, but this is one of probably my most anticipated ones, just because it sounds so fascinating. And like I said, it's got a lot of things in there that I love, especially the isolationist aspect of it. So I'm excited about this one. Another one that comes out on the 21st, it's another author that I'd never heard of before. And I had no idea that this author had such an extensive backlist, but I'm excited about now that I've read the synopsis of this is It's One of Us by JT Ellison. So this follows our main character, Olivia. She's a home interior designer, but she's currently struggling with infertility. She and her husband are going through IVF. They are desperate. They're doing everything to have a baby. And then one night police knock on their door and deliver the astonishing news that DNA evidence has linked Park's son. So Park is Olivia's husband, Park's son to a murder. And he is now the prime suspect in a murder investigation. But Olivia is really confused because she and Park don't have any children and Park didn't come into their relationship with any children. So how could this be? And that's when Olivia finds out that her husband was a sperm donor and he has no idea like how many times his sperm was actually used, how many children he sired or things like that. As the murder investigation goes deeper, more terrible truths come to light. With every revelation, Olivia must face the unthinkable. The man she married has fathered a killer, but can she hold it against him when she keeps such a dark secret of her own? Okay, so not only are we dealing with that whole thing, but it sounds like Olivia herself has some secrets. So this is definitely multi-layered. What is really fascinating about this to me is I listened to a podcast and I can't remember, 
I think it's called Biohacked, but the very first season of that was all about sperm donation and the complications that go along with that because there's a lot of privacy laws surrounding sperm donation, but yet that puts the children in a terrible position because they could have medical conditions that they don't know anything about because they are not able to know their father because of these privacy reasons. And so this podcast dives really deeply into all of that and I found it absolutely fascinating because of course there's a lot of drama that is involved in this and there are a lot of people that are affected that you don't necessarily think of or the men don't necessarily think of when they are going to donate sperm or the women don't think of when they are going to accept the sperm. So when I read the synopsis of this I was like okay that really reminds me of the podcast and I want to kind of see what drama unfolds from that in this story and then again it makes me really intrigued to go back through JT Ellison's backlist to see what else she has written because I had never heard of her before and if her other books sound just as intriguing as this one I absolutely want to read more from her in the future. The 21st seems to be a big release from books because another interesting one that is coming out is I have some questions for you by Rebecca Mackay. Again this is another author that I've not heard of but the synopsis of this I found really intriguing. It follows a successful film professor and podcaster Bodie Kane who is content to forget her past, the family tragedy that marred her adolescence, her four largely miserable years at a New Hampshire boarding school and the murder of her former roommate Talia Keith in the spring of their senior year. Though the circumstances surrounding Talia's death and the conviction of the school's athletic trainer Omar Evans are hotly debated online, Bodie prefers or needs to let sleeping dogs lie. But when the Granby school invites her back to teach a course, Bodie is inexorably drawn to the case and its increasingly apparent flaws. In their rush to convict Omar, did the school and the police overlook other suspects? Is the real killer still out there? As she falls down the very rabbit hole she was so determined to avoid, Bodie begins to wonder if she was as much of an outsider at Granby as she thought. If perhaps back in 1995 she knew something that might have held the key to solving the case. So again this has a lot of buzzwords for me. You have a podcast host, you have a reluctant return home, you have a woman who has a tragic past and now she's going to have to confront that when she goes home and she's going to have to try to solve whatever is happening here. A lot going on in this that I found really really intriguing and so when I heard of it I absolutely had to share it with y'all because this sounds fantastic. It says Rebecca Mackay is the author of The Great Believers which was a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. So it sounds like she's a very talented author and I'm absolutely willing to give this one a shot. So this one has already been added to my future TBR. Also on the 21st is Things We Hide From The Light by Lucy Score. It sounds like this is the second book in her Knock em Out. I don't know if it's a duology series, companion series, what have you. So I really don't want to read the synopsis of this, but it sounds like it might be harder hitting romance stories. Let me read you the synopsis of the first book, Things We Never Got Over. Naomi wasn't just running away from her wedding. She was riding to the rescue of her estranged twin to knock him out Virginia, a rough around the edges town where disputes are settled the old fashioned way with fists and beer, usually in that order. Too bad for Naomi, her evil twin hasn't changed at all. After helping herself to Naomi's car and cash, Tina leaves her with something unexpected. The niece Naomi didn't know she had. Now she's stuck in town with no car, no job, no plan, and no home with an 11 year old going on 30 to take care of. Bearded bad boy Barber Knox prefers to live his life the way he takes his coffee, alone, unless you count his basset hound, Waylon. There's a reason Knox doesn't do complications or high maintenance women, especially not the romantic ones, but since Naomi's life imploded right in front of him, the least he can do is help her out of a jam. And just as soon as she stops getting into new trouble, he can leave her alone and get back to his peaceful solitary life. At least that's the plan until the trouble turns to real danger. Again, Things We Hide From The Light is the second book. It sounds like it's going to be a companion series, so I don't necessarily know if you need to read this book before you can read the second, but I don't want to risk anything by reading the synopsis of that second book. So we'll just go ahead and leave it here with this first one. But I had seen this cover going around of Things We Never Got Over, and it was never on my radar because I assumed that it was young adult just based from the cover. But after reading the synopsis, I was very much intrigued, and so I added it to my TBR. And if I enjoy this one, I will absolutely be reading Things We Hide From The Light. So I wanted to go ahead and mention it here in case you were a fan of Things We Never Got Over, because the second book in that series is coming out in February on the 21st. And then finally, the last book that is coming out on the 21st is Best Served Hot by Amanda Elliott. It sounds like this might be another hate to love like romantic comedy. By day, Julia Zimmerman works as an executive assistant. After hours, she's at Julie Z Eats NYC, a social media restaurant reviewer with over 50,000 followers. As much as she loves her self-employed side gig, what Julie really wants is to be a critic at a major newspaper like the New York Scroll. The only thing worse than the Scroll's rejection of her application is the fact that the smarmy social media averse society boy Bennett Richard McAllister Wright snagged her dream job. While at the Central Park Food Festival, Julie confronts the annoyingly handsome Bennett about his outdated opinions on social media and posts the resulting video footage. Julie's follower count soars and so does the scrolls. Julie and Bennett grudgingly agree to partner up for a few reviews to further their buzz, online buzz, obviously. Over tapas, burgers, and more, Julie and Bennett connect over their shared love of food. But when the competitive fire between them turns extra spicy, they'll have to decide how much heat their relationship can take. So this just recently came on my radar and I wanted to share it here because it sounds sweet, like the perfect, like hate to love romantic comedy. Food is 100% a bonding experience in my opinion. So I am absolutely here for this romantic comedy and I have definitely added it to my TBR. All right, then getting into the very final releases for February, we only have two more left. On the 28th, we have The Angel Maker by Alex North. Now this is not one that I 
I'm personally going to be pursuing just because I've kind of determined that Alex North is not the author for me but I know that he is a very popular well-loved author of thrillers and I wanted to mention him here. It follows our main character Katie Shaw and she grew up in a beautiful house in the English countryside. At the cusp of graduation she had big dreams, a devoted boyfriend, and a little brother she protected fiercely until the day a violent stranger changed the fate of her family forever. Years later still unable to live down the guilt surrounding what happened to her brother Chris and now with a child of her own to protect, Katie struggles to separate the real threats from the imagined. Then she gets the phone call. Chris has gone missing and needs his big sister once more. Meanwhile, Detective Lawrence Page is facing a particularly gruesome crime. A distinguished professor of fate and free will has been brutally murdered just hours after firing his staff. All the leads point back to two old cases, the gruesome attack on teenager Christopher Shaw and the despicable crimes of a notorious serial killer who, legend had it, could see the future. So definitely sounds like there are some multi-layered things here. There was a crime in the past that still has repercussions for the future and now a current crime might lead back to that past as well as to a serial killer on the loose. It does definitely sound interesting but like I said I am personally am not going to pursue reading this but just in case you are a fan of Alex North I wanted to let you know. Another one that I personally will not be reading, but I wanted to go ahead and let y'all know that it was coming out in case you were a fan of The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. The prequel novel, A Day of Fallen Night, is coming out on the 28th. I will not read the synopsis of this just in case there are or could be any potential spoilers for what happened in The Priory of the Orange Tree. I wouldn't think so just because this is a prequel novel, but I don't want to risk giving absolutely anything away for those who want to go into like The Priory of the Orange Tree kind of blind. That prequel novel is coming out on the 28th if you are interested. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are some of the books that I found interesting that are coming out in February. Please comment down below and let me know if you were interested in any of these books or let me know some of the releases you are excited about in February. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up. I post videos twice a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and have a video to film. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.